Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Voyager 1 is the most distant human created object. It was launched in 1977, and as I speak, it is about 166 astronomical units from the Sun and getting further away at about 3.5 AU per year. And it is experiencing the fall of night, not because the planet is turning and the sun is setting, but because it is going further and further away from the sun. And I sort of got it into my head to try and figure out just how dark things are, how far it will go, and what things would look like if you were out there. So I did the math, and at 166 AU, the sun has a magnitude of minus 15.7, and that maybe doesn't mean much to you, but the moon the full moon, under perfect circumstances, has a magnitude of about minus 12.74. So this is still at three magnitudes brighter than the full moon. Now this is Space Engine, and I just changed the settings to lock in the exposure settings from when it was pointed directly at the sun. So the sun is still bright enough that it is washing out all but the brightest stars at this point. I'm sure you've all experienced what a full moon is like. It's easy to see what you're doing. And at 166 AU, the sun is still 16 times brighter than the full moon. Although interestingly, it's not as bright as a full Earth as seen from the surface of the moon. The way we figure this out is with the magnitude distance relationship. The sun's visible magnitude is minus 26.83, which means it's really bright. The full moon's apparent magnitude is minus 12.74. You take the difference between those, you get 14.09. Now your distance factor is then 10 to the power of this magnitude difference divided by 5. So that's 10 to the power 2.8828. That's 658 AU, where the sun becomes as faint as the full moon. So yeah, about 668 uh, astronomical units out. The human eye is working more or less just fine, but you are very cold. Uh, it's interesting to note that if you calculate the orbit of a parabolic comet, it takes about a thousand years to reach that distance. So there are no comets which humans have actually definitively got the orbital elements for that we know have reached this distance. Although there's many old, like ancient comets that have probably reached this distance after visiting the inner solar system. Basically what I'm saying is there's nothing in living memory that has got so far from the sun where the sun is, you know, merely one of the brightest stars. So we can apply this magnitude distance relationship to figure out how far you'd be to you know, make the sun look the same as, uh, say, any other celestial body that we have, that you have seen, right? Uh, and, and so uh, Mercury, that's the third brightest natural celestial body. Obviously, the ISS is actually slightly brighter and sometimes we get, you know, satellite flares are brighter. But that gets, that's about a magnitude of minus 4.2. And yeah, to get the sun being that faint, you have to go out something like 30,000 astronomical units. That is 194 light days, half a light year before the sun is merely a bright star in the sky. But it still outshines Sirius, which has a magnitude of minus 1.46. To make it even fainter than Sirius, you have to go out to 118,000 AU, 686 light days. Basically, two light years out, and only then is the Earth sun fainter than the brightest star that we have in the sky from Earth. And, you know, just as an aside, I sort of get interested to wonder, what are the brightest stars in other star system skies? And I found a Gliese 710, which is about one light year from New Serpentis. And in its skies, New Serpentis would be magnitude minus 5.5, which is pretty damn bright. But also I found out that Gliese 710 is projected to pass very close to the sun in about 1.3 million years, it's going to pass within a quarter of a light year. And while future humanity will no doubt be saying that's a pretty cool star and watch it slowly move across the sky, you know, a million years after that, there'll be comets coming down because it flew through the Oort cloud. So anyway, doing these kind of calculations with magnitudes and stuff is actually pretty simple. You know, it's something you learn as a first year astronomy student. But a lot of you might be wondering, where the heck the actual magnitude system comes from? Why do we use magnitudes? Why don't we use, you know, like absolute energy fluxes or something that's metric? 
The magnitude system goes back over 2,000 years. We've got to start with Hipparchus, who published probably the first star catalogue. He catalogued a whole bunch of constellations, supposedly 850 stars. And not only did he catalogue the positions, but he also talked about the brightnesses. They were a brilliant light of second degree, or they were faint, right? This was a rough estimate based on the human eye. Now then, a couple of hundred years later, Ptolemy comes along and he actually assigns numbers. There's first magnitude stars, second magnitude, so on and so forth, down to sixth. And basically, the lower the number, the brighter the star. And it's generally believed that the way he did this was by waiting for darkness and watching the stars emerge. And the ones that emerged first were the brightest. Now, as time goes on, other people create catalogues, Al-Sufi, Tycho Brahe. But the big change would be... The invention of the telescope. Now astronomers have a new tool and they can look deeper into the sky. Not only can they magnify stuff, but they can actually see fainter stars. And that means they need to extend their magnitude system. And there's a big problem because the human eye isn't really that great at figuring out how bright something is. Unless it's placed next to something of similar brightness, they can say that one is brighter than the other. But when you've got a telescope, your field of view is so stopped down suddenly you can't see those two stars to compare them. So there's a whole bunch of variations that we get over the next few centuries as as astronomers try to catalogue the skies. And so in the early 19th century, we get to see the first tools to help standardise this. They start working with like, you know, smoked glass that will try to reduce the magnitude by a certain known amount. And then there's a guy called uh, Carl von Steinhell who develops a telescope that can basically use a split lens to look at two stars so you can compare against a standard object. And then in 1861, a guy called Friedrich Zollner developed, well, the Zollner photometer. And this would generate a standard candle, right? Using a kerosene flame, they would have a set of polarizing prisms, which would allow them to adjust the exact brightness until it matched. And then they could read out the values. And this was basically what was used until photography took over. But apparently these devices were in use into the 1940s. But there was still the problem that the original scale of 1 through 6 was absolutely arbitrary, defined by some like ancient Greek, and uh, no one was really sure how to extend it to these fainter objects. Now, an important part of this is that because it comes from the human eye, it's following the way the human eye responds to light, and that is a sort of logarithmic process. So people looked at applying various ratios between the magnitudes, so that the first magnitude was maybe three times as bright as the second magnitude. William Dawes was using a factor of four, but the one that would win was a guy called William Pogson, who was interested in asteroids, and in 1856, he wrote a paper where he basically predicted the magnitudes of a bunch of minor planets for the following year. This was the kind of publication that would be completely forgotten about today if it wasn't for the footnotes. He writes about trying to pick the right value and he settles on having each magnitude be different by a factor of 2.52 because if they chose that value then five magnitudes of difference would be a factor of a hundred in the brightness and that made the calculation suddenly so much easier. It meant suddenly you could use base 10 logarithms everywhere. You could eliminate a whole bunch of extra computation if you used this magic number. It was one of many possible ways of fitting modern observational techniques to old systems, but it was the one that simplified the amount of work, and that's why it ended up winning. So yeah, if you have a difference of five magnitudes, that's a, a difference of 100 in terms of brightness. Now, when we're talking about distances, remember that goes as the inverse square, so you take the square root of that, it turns out that five magnitudes is 10 times further away or 10 times closer if it's five magnitudes brighter. For things that can be observed from Earth, we're typically talking anything from minus 30 to plus 30 magnitudes. And given that, you know, five magnitudes is a factor of 100, that's a a range of 10 to the power 24, or a trillion trillion. And this range isn't set in stone or anything. As we develop bigger and bigger telescopes, we will be able to see higher and higher magnitude stars that are fainter. And equally, if there's something really bright, it could be even more negative than the sun. For example, if you pointed your telescope at a relatively nearby nuclear explosion. And and, and for that reason, of course, distance is actually important. And we have the concept of the absolute magnitude and the apparent magnitude. I've mostly been talking about the apparent magnitude. That is like what we actually see on Earth. 
But in order to make comparisons of the intrinsic properties of stars, we have the absolute magnitude, which is where you recalibrate its apparent magnitude to what it would look like if it were 10 parsecs away. And for example, the star Rigel, it is one of the brightest stars in our night sky, and its absolute magnitude is minus 7.84. It is a staggeringly bright blue star, but it is also about a thousand light years away. That is about 310 parsecs. So that's 31 times the absolute magnitude uh, calibration distance of 10 parsecs. So uh, take the log 10 of that, right? Log 10, 31, and multiply that number by five and you get 7.45, which you, know, you can see how a seven point, minus 7.8 magnitude gets reduced down to basically a zero with magnitude star just by that distance equation. Our sun, by comparison, is an absolute wimp. At 10 parsecs, its magnitude is 4.8. It's basically a fifth magnitude star that most people would overlook. And there are fainter stars still. Proxima Centauri is this tiny little red dwarf, and its absolute magnitude is 15.6. So that's 10,000 times fainter than the sun. And from Earth, its apparent magnitude is about 11. It's basically invisible unless you've got a telescope. But consider that it is part of the Alpha Centauri system. It's like, you know, a few thousand astronomical units out. If there was a planet around like Alpha Centauri A or B, then I, I think the Proxima Centauri would barely be visible as like a third magnitude star in their skies. Anyway, that was uh, quite a diversion. But, yeah, my original question had been, you know, how far do you have to go from the solar system before the sun just looks like any other star? And depending upon what your definition of any other star is, you, you might need to go half a light year. You might need to go two light years. But yeah, you don't have to go that far away from the sun before it's the least important thing in the sky. Well, at least in astronomical terms. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.